Okay, so I got all the screws out of this. I was actually kind of surprised that some of the flathead screws were pretty resistant. Um, you know, they have a bit of a sleeve on them. Um, there's a bit of a shank to these, and I don't know why, but some of the older ones, uh, when they don't have a threaded uh, base that rides right up to the pickguard, for some reason they kind of get stuck. I think it's just because the threads kind of act as a deterrent and when you've got an open sleeve like that, uh, moisture from perspiration can get down and in there and find a good mating surface and get them stuck. So we got them out of there. Let's just go ahead and have a look inside. I didn't realize how long this uh, particular instrument had been um, you know, off the playground, so to speak, when I actually spoke to uh, the gentleman who owns it, who is from a very good band called The Loons here in town. Um, he had actually said that he hadn't been playing this for like almost 10 years, which kind of made sense because some of it looked like it had been there for a while, but some of it hadn't. But uh, the thing is, is that with these, uh, I did tell him that by Sunday it was going to be show ready. But if I'm going to put that designation on it, I want to make sure I'm looking around inside. Now, he had only asked for a setup, uh, but I do want to go through the electrics and at least see if we've got anything that's glaring at us that could create a problem. And then maybe use some contact cleaner to get some of these sliding switches working again. Oh, yeah, that's like... Barely hanging on. Okay, so now that we've actually gotten in a little bit closer here, I'm going to show you why we're going to need to re-solder this jack. If you look at this blue wire, see that? And that is exactly why I will always check under the guard if I ever say show ready. So this thing's literally got two strands of lead holding it together. And if I didn't check this, on Sunday, I would have handed this off to a touring musician and told them that this was good to go. And that's the way to do it. That's why we always check under the guard. Okay, so we've got some strings on it now, and I uh, got some tension on it, stretched them out a little bit, and they've all settled in really well. The only thing that I uh, have noticed is, is that out of all these tuners, which are a really interesting design, that this one right here uh, doesn't seem to uh, want to stabilize. It has a lot of slack coming back up into pitch. Now, when it comes to tuners, unfortunately, other than lubricating them and cleaning them, there's not really a lot you can do because, you know, if the steel is stressed out and is fluctuating, it's kind of one of those things. It's like tin foil. You're never going to get it straight again. So if we get in real close here, what you see is, is that there is a space in between the cogs, that in between these teeth, there's a space there. Now, commonly what uh, they do is when they build these they build a bit of tension into them so that as they wear they mesh together but unfortunately this one looks like after so many years that the spacing on these gears has gotten too wide and the pinion here has gotten too narrow and you can see lots of scoring there and things like that but look how overbuilt this tuner is I mean when you look at the uprights right here and here they're really industrial strength. Even the Gibson stuff that you see on like the Melody Makers, like the EBOs, the last one that we did, uh, that uh, Lake Placid blue one, the tuners on those had thinner sidewalls than this. This is pretty industrial. Most of the guitars that I see, the origins of their hardware is pretty obvious to see. It's, it's pretty, pretty generic. It kind of walks a fine line, but this guy, it's different and you know what these hagstroms tend to remind me of is a lot of the hardware that you saw uh, coming out of the domestic production in the United States during the 1930s 
And what I mean by that is, is when you're looking at hardware from the 1930s, you see things like this. You see edges of castings that are completely rolled off and have a tendency of being much softer in the edge than the modern stuff. Because back then, you didn't have mechanized assembly lines to the same capacity that you have now. You had a lot of hand sanding before finishing. So what was happening was, is a lot of workers on the line were being handed a very aggressive paper or a medium for which to be able to mill the edges of these things uh, for speed. And what was happening was, is that they were overhitting the edges. Now, that might sound like a detriment, but it's actually not. When it comes to hardware like this, Things like the basic intuition of production have a tendency of really saving you heartache later on. If you look right here, you got a corner here that on any brand new guitar would be razor sharp. This thing's been totally worn off. And it was worn off before it was played because we see that the zinc nickel based uh, coating is over that edge. You've got a lot of stuff like that. It's over engineered. It, it's, it's, if it needs to hold 50 pounds, they make it to hold 200. And that's kind of you know, a fixture of that early 20th century manufacturing. Everything was overbuilt. And you find that type of philosophy right here. Everything down to the screws. I know these are all flathead screws, but let me tell you something. When you actually go ahead and look at this, and this guitar has been played. I know the gentleman who owns it. I know he uses it. But when you look at things like the heads of screws, there's no frayed edge. There's no stripped centers on any of these. Every screw on this guitar is completely original and I wouldn't dream of losing one because you're never gonna find a super lightweight, narrow, you know, flat head recess like that with the type of nickel plating that has the tendency of going brown versus getting rusty or getting really, really pitted. You're just not gonna be able to find it because that type of build quality just isn't around anymore. Now, obviously the Tunematic Bridge was a later addition and regrettably it doesn't fit too perfectly on the posts. It, there's a little bit of give there. Now, concerning the truss adjustment, we have a fairly sophisticated looking system here. If you look, we've got an Allen bolt dead center and then this wide anchor that stabilizes the entire piece and it branches out top and bottom and makes contact with, with the neck pocket right here at the bottom. It's actually pretty ahead of its time. You've got good clearance here, can get in here with an Allen key pretty easily without bumping this pick guard too much, which is why this doesn't have that strat damage where you see all the uh, knife edge uh, hitting the pick guard right there. Pretty ahead of its time. It's interesting because this guitar kind of has two halves in a mechanical sense when it comes to the hardware, the tuners, the pickups, uh, the bridge, everything is overbuilt and uh, built to a really pretty, pretty high grade. I mean, this stuff is bordering on aircraft quality type fitment. Uh, everything is countersunk and all the mating surfaces really meet up nicely. But then we contrast it to the electrics. The tone cut seems to almost invert the signal between the pickups. Can't quite figure out what's going on there. And there are occasions where I can't tell if I have a switch set wrong or if something is not connecting. Uh, and then all of a sudden the sound is gone and I change it back and it goes back. I have gone in there with contact cleaner and gave it a quick tidy. And now it appears that everything is working as it should, but it's just not the most intuitive of systems. So that's the thing that's kind of interesting about this guitar. There really is a duality. On one hand, you've got the electrics are a little confusing to use and sometimes not so clear on exactly what it is that you're doing by hitting a switch or, or something along those lines. But you know, if you were familiar enough with those electrics, you'd be able to find your way around. But when we do really take the time to look at the hardware, as it fits together, the intricacy of the design kind of reminds me of Bigsby tailpieces. When you see a Bigsby tailpiece, that is an interdependence on another market. Bigsby was not a guitar maker. Bigsby was a person who enjoyed customizing motorcycles and working with aluminum and polished aluminum and things like that. And he saw that his particular design would have uh, a notable resiliency and stability comparative to some of the purpose-built tremolos of the time, which were depending on pretty mincy, flat folded steel spring designs. So after kind of going through this thing and really having a good listen to it, uh, just a couple of takeaways. First off, I want one of these. <laughs> I really want one. I, I never got into these in the past. I don't know why. I, I, I just didn't discover them. They didn't land in my lap. I had actually seen uh, the Loons play about 
12 or 13 years ago uh, when I was still a little more green. And uh, I saw them play at the Casbah uh, here in Southern California and was absolutely blown away. But I, even then, never really thought uh, to pick up one of these Hagstroms and really give them a good go around. You know, we have uh, such a propensity to kind of fall into predictability, even when watching movies or listening to music, we kind of reach for what is our favorite. So, you know, even though we're a little resistant now and again to discover new things, you know, uh, and this is definitely not new, this, is, this, is, this thing's been around longer than I have, the truth of it is, is that, you know, some of those times where you do get something punted in front of you and you're forced to kind of break out of your comfort zone and play something that you've never played before, uh, there's a lot of really, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of great stuff to pull out of this guitar. It's just got tons to offer. The, the, the finish quality is great. The build quality is great. The tolerances are built really, really tight. I mean, if, obviously I've used the phrase aircraft quality, but, uh, this is probably one of the few guitars that really got that close, even comparatively to the new stuff. You know, because when you're taking apart the new stuff, you know, you're taking apart like a Schecter or something like that, you're still finding Fender level uh, discrepancies in build quality because they're using a lot of different parts on a lot of different guitars. It's not always going to be perfect. Uh, but in this case, it is. And it really sounds great. Go out and get your hands on one of these, even just to play or borrow for the day, just to kind of break it out. And I will see you guys next week.